Welcome to Swisspreneur, a podcast about startup stories and hands-on learnings from experienced entrepreneurs. My name is Sylvan and I will be your host. On today's episode, we welcome Frank Thielen. He's mostly known as investor of the German Shark Tank version called Die Hürle der Löwen. We will talk about why it's okay to actually lose money as a startup company in the early days, how to come back and fight your way back after a huge personal failure with personal debt, and also why timing is key in entrepreneurship and what you can actually do about that as a startup founder. It was a pleasure to talk to Frank, and for the first time, we also added some rapid fire questions that you can find at the end of the podcast. As always, there is also additional content on social media, so make sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram. Before we get started with the episode, I would like to introduce you to SBB Startup. If you think that your company is a good fit for the Swiss Railways, get in touch with them or learn more about their startup programs at spbstartup.com. Frank, very well welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks for taking the time. My pleasure. I would like to start with your entrepreneurial career. You were not great at school and were almost financially ruined by your first company, The Twist, HE, that you founded. Yeah. And I want to know how you dealt with, you know, the criticism and also the fear of failure. How do you make sure to still go back, stand up and try it again? Yeah, it was really very challenging, a very, very tough time. Um, I was young uh, and my friends kind of getting starting with life. So they got the first good job, the girlfriend, their first car, maybe. And exactly in this point in time, I was I was bankrupt. I was I was I was done. I was my my body was not working properly anymore because there was so much pressure. Uh, because when you're young, you have the, the the future, hopefully bright future in front of us. And 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 if you if you don't see that, there was a real big challenge. So, who helped me out? My my dad helped me. Um, my family, because my parents never lost trust. They were kind of angry in a fair way because it was really bad what I did. It was not by bad intention, but the result was very bad. Um, yeah, and, and, and what, what, what was the, the way out was technology because there was a new uh, software development kit coming out and I just played around with it and, and over that diving into the new technology, I forgot about the problems. I mean, it was not very smart, but because I love technology so much, I just dived into it. And in the end, um, I found solutions for all the challenges. Uh, but the main driver out was, was my love for, for technology. Which you also discovered when your parents bought your computer and you were playing around with it at, yeah. long at night. Yeah. You also had a, always a very product focus as a founder in your companies. Yeah. How do you balance the, the product focus with the more business or also sales focus? Because having a, a good product only is not leading you to any sales, right? Absolutely. So yeah, if you want to say my, my earlier career as a founder and investor, I was really only uh, driven by the product. And that made some successes and other things failed. Um, today, I look also at the market. So is it a great product? I'm still a product guy, but how huge is the market? Because if there's no big market, you, you have no huge cash flow and you cannot build a great team, a big team, who's then developing um, the, the product in, in, in something very unique. So today, I have... Um, a broad look on, on the market and the, on, um, the financial potential. Um, I still don't read any Excel files, so I don't care about cash flow and planning, but, but I look today in how big is the market, what's the financial opportunity, so that we can finance an outstanding team to keep up 
and grow the, the product. I think you mentioned two very important success factors, the size of the market as well as the team. What would be a good number for terms of market size to go after as a startup founder? Wow, that's very tough. I mean, as a founder, um, if, if you generate like 10 million uh, euros in revenues, it, it, it can be a great business. And, and uh, that's totally fine. But I am an old guy, I have gray hair, so um, I have a 10 year plan and vision that is very, very ambitious. So don't copy it. Or uh, There are also great startups that are doing smaller things like I have done in my past. So what we at, at Freigeist see is, is, is the potential of doing billions, billions in revenues. And it's, it's not about that we are insane, but it's about that we have the luxury uh, and having earned some money with, with successful uh, companies and that we now want to focus on relevant technology out of Europe. And this has to generate billions of revenue so that you have a huge team and uh, can afford to, to um, build great technology. But it's not a standard and it's, um, there are other super great startups doing smaller revenues. It's totally up to the founder what makes sense for him. So the, the one important thing is that you can finance in the mid or long term your business. In the start, it's totally fine to burn capital because you're investing. That's something we, we, we often get wrong in Germany, that we too fast want to, to, want to get profitable. But you have to have a plan. When you did the land grabbing, when you achieved a certain amount of user base, how do you monetize them? What is your business model? And Amazon and Tesla and, and many other great companies had a, had a huge long burn rate, but they had a clear plan. Jeff and Elon, they're very, very clear and precise about where they are standing in 10 years. So they have a great plan. So if, you, if you're losing money for a long time, no problem, but you have to have a proper plan. How do you make this a very successful business after that investment period? And what's a good time frame there? Because also you as investors, you know, at a certain point, you might get a bit nervous. Like, do they really stick to the plan? What would be a good time frame to get to that point? That's totally up to the founder and investor. We have a very long term investing. So for us, it's uh, we're investing only our uh, own money. So there's no external money in, in, in Freigeist. So we are more patient. Um, other investors, if you're investing at the end of the investment period of a fund, um, then it might don't have enough time. So you can also ask your investor, normally they have several funds, like, like the first fund, the second fund, the third fund, they have, um, and then you can ask, where, what, what's the status of your fund? Would be kind of the last investment, would be kind of the first investment, and I believe it's fair to say in the venture capital industry that they get faster nervous if you're one of the last of the, of the new fund generation. Um, yeah, but, but find a um, a fund or an investor that backs your plan. It can also be a plan to say we are profitable in three years, which can also be fine. Sure. But it can also be a plan and say we need 10 years because first we want to develop this, then this, then we need 1 million users, then we need and then there's a huge business, but we need this period of time. So yeah, be very open with that the, and find the right investor that, that's not getting nervous and that backs your plan. Mm -hmm. And long term for you means in years approximately ten plus or yeah absolutely over over ten years so um, the partners of of Freigeist they 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 all agreed that for the next ten years they will do nothing else only focusing on the investments because otherwise it takes so long and we want to have the same team in place that that we really want to work long term with the with the founders and that's that's why. Um, the executives committed on a 10-year plan. Cool. You seem to have a very committed team at Freigeist. Absolutely. Do you see any parallels between having your investing team, your, your partner team, also to, to your startups? Are there parallels what make a good team from your perspective and from your learnings? A good team, um, first of all, should be from for different people with different responsibilities, different passions, and not a team where everybody studied at the same university, has the same idea. So three designers, three, three software developers, 
are normally an, an awful team, but you have to be very different. For example, I am kind of the kind of the the guy going on stage, doing la 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 la, a lot of communication. Uh, and Mark is super smart and super reliable in, in, in finance and legal stuff and so on. And th this makes sense. We have totally different roles. And then we have Alex, for example, who's a brilliant um, technology guy, m much better than, than me. And so it's, it's clear which roles we, we have. So we, yeah, together we are an orchestra. So everybody plays a different instrument. Um, that's very important. And do you have like a common ground where you say you share the same values about how you want to do business or what is your Absolutely. common ground? Okay. Values are so important. And we have to get better at this because while getting old and having gray hair, I'm getting more and more serious about working with the right people. And having the right values, if they're are challenging times. Having the right values, if you talk to somebody where you are fully in control, so you have, I don't know, there's a, there's a fuck up in the contract, the founder signed it, so we can basically do whatever we want with the founder. And then having the right people that don't utilize this mistake, but just keep with the same values and say, no, we wanted to have this in the contract and this is how we live it, I don't care what you signed, but, but we had an agreement. So it's super important that you can rely on, the, on these ethics, on these values. Otherwise, you cannot go fast. You, you have trust is the most important thing. And I just recently learned, again, how important that is. And that is one of the things I want to get better at. Only work with founders that have the right ethics. It's, it's so important. That probably also shaped you with the personal liability of your credit loan from the bank at Twist. Absolutely. And can you give us an example of what important values you, you look for in, in founders? Maybe your top two to three picks. Being humble, being focused on the, on the product and the technology. Whenever there's a girl or a guy who can do it better, step back. Don't do politics and say, I'm the CEO. Um, be honest and reliable. If, 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 if I called you and, and we had an agreement, stick to it. And these are the values that we try and I hope we live um, uh, in, in our team. And even more than ever before, we want to make sure that we have the same founders in our team. Cool. Other important success factors can be timing or also luck. Absolutely, absolutely. Can you influence them or what is your take on this? Timing is super important. For example, we, we sold the first company just before the crash in 2008, I believe, was the, was the huge crash. And we, and we sold the company at the end or beginning of 2008 or end of 2007, something around this. Quite frankly, six months later, we would not have sold it. Um, so timing can be important, but again, our value is to don't care too much about it. If you say, okay, th now this is the wave, we want to go that wave, or now's the right timing, I believe it's the wrong approach. You have to have the long-term approach and say, we believe these are the technologies we want to invest in, these are the kind of founders, and then, then, then just work continuously, uh, don't get too excited and want to get a, a fast, quick exit, but just, just work straight, have your values. But if you then want to sell a company or you, you have to have the luck of time that just the right partner comes along, that, that, that you need that luck. Sure. But you should not build your company, your product around that and try to, to have more luck. Focus on your product, on your team, on your values, on your long-term strategy, and luck will find you. And don't try to time it. It's the same, a little bit different, but it's the same with stocks. There are people who tell me, yeah, I timed the stocks, and now I know it goes down. This, this will not work. Have an opinion about whether Tesla or Siemens or Daimler or whatever is the right stock, if you want to buy stock, and then stay in. And only change it if the management changes or whatever, but not because of the timing, then just stay in because 
you said that's a great company, that's why I invested. If this changes, then go out, but not about timing. So it, 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 in general, I'm not a, I hate timing. Sometimes it helps and you need that luck, but have a clear plan and just follow it. So basically also, if you really believe in something and you stick to your plan, your time will eventually come if you have luck enough endurance. Yeah. Yeah. In, in German, we say, uh, das Glück ist mit den Tüchtigen. Yeah? So if you work hard, luck will find you. Absolutely. However, there might also be a certain point when you say, hey, this case is, is actually not working out. What are signs for you to then actually stop being committed to a certain case? What would be like the red flags where you pull off? The, the first and most important red flag is if we see that the founding team is not executing as we expected. And then, of course, you, have, you talk about that and say, hey, why did, didn't you deliver the product? Why did you hire that person where I said, it's a bad idea to hire him? And if we then see after several conversations that we don't have a match, that when we invested, we thought we were totally aligned, we're not aligned, then that is a red flag. And then, then, then we also try, we don't jeopardize the company, we don't threat them or put this, the, our shares on the market. But if we then find a way out, for both parties, uh, then, then we go out. But again, it's our job that this basically never happens again. So we, 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 we work hard on understanding before we invest, are we aligned, are the ethics, the values, the long-term plan absolutely aligned. But yeah, sometimes it might happen. So that's one of the, the, the worst things where we see the team does not fit anymore. Because a product you can, you can change. So there's a saying, get the right people on the bus and we will drive wherever it takes. So where we want to go. So that, that's kind of the philosophy from us. Get the right, get the right people on the bus. One last uh, important success factor that I would like to, to talk about is fundraising. You've done both. You've uh, got huge VC fundings but you also bootstrap your company, IP Labs. Absolutely. So do you have any preference in terms of funding? Which do you, would you go for today? It totally depends on the business. Some businesses you can bootstrap and they are great because investors are also a pain. There's no such thing as a free lunch. An investor brings money, brings speed, brings hopefully added value, but it also brings downsides and you really have to think do you need venture capital or investment in general or can you bootstrap both have pros and cons and there's no no right for example if you want to build a plane like Lilium Aviation you need venture capital no chance without that yeah I, well I believe it. sorry there's really no chance um, but if you're building an app it might be the opportunity that you have a designer, a developer, and, and a marketing guy, uh, three founders that have, can live for free at their parents, then why not build an app and, and grow out of it? I mean, there's so many great examples uh, of that where, where companies have just grown out of the cash flow and become great companies. So both ways are perfectly fine. Think about what is the best way for you. I would also like to talk about a more international scope. Uh, most startup success stories are currently written in the United States and China is rapidly catching up. Oh yeah. Where do you see Europe's role in the future and how do you, we make sure that we are still relevant in the future? China and US, and Ch China especially, they're, they're so progressive. They, they, they're really moving ahead and they're putting a lot of capital at work and, and, and you have GAFA, but I will add a T to that. So GAFA, also Tesla, um, being companies that are today or will be soon at, um, at hundreds of, of, of um, billions of valuation. And you have Tencent and Alibaba and, and, and all these guys in China. And we did not build one of them in Europe today. And that is a huge problem because, of course, there, 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 there are those hidden champions like Sennheiser you just had here at the conference or Miele and so on. But we also need global relevant champions that own a space like we did with the car industry. We basically worldwide dominated that space. This will change, I believe. Let's see. 
And we need new players that dominate relevant spaces. It, it, it can be quantum computing, it can be AI, it can be 5G, it can be blockchain, it can be social media, but I believe uh, Facebook has really is owning that space. Whatever it is, but a relevant big, big market, and we own it. Like vertical takeoff landing jets. It will be a super big market. I want to own it out of Europe. Quantum computer, I want to own it. And that's my, my mission. And of course, I'm a, only a super small piece in a, in a very, very big orchestra uh, trying to make that happen. Because right until today, we're not even on a playing field. We have to be honest. What role does education play in that regard? Um, a big role, because uh, when you look at why is, for example, uh, Silicon Valley so successful, it's, it's, uh, it's one university <laughs> that that stands out and basically has touched every single founder. Um, so outstanding universities are super, super important. That's why I'm here um, today. Um, and we need, unfortunately, also have these elite universities. We need, in general, good universities, but we need, I don't know, three, four, five, six outstanding universities with higher budgets because they will then generate these outstanding companies. I know it's not a popular topic and I want to have in general, a better education for everybody. But if we don't have, if we don't allow that others are standing out, then we will not have outstanding uh, companies. Yeah. What is your impression of the Start Summit? I mean, you gave a very impressive speech and you also interacted with the, with the audience in a very, very nice way and gave clear statements. What's your impression of the conference? How do you like it? Conferences like, like these are very important because they they give an impulse to to people and having new ideas talking to people building the network and then and getting started and i hope that out of this conference maybe i don't know 10 or 20 new startups are created because they got the the idea the the missing technology guy the missing marketing guy met them here and then created a, a company or just leaving the company and thinking out of the box and thinking bigger because they had they learned something here where they now see their startup in a different light. And you can only do that with interaction, with meeting, feeling, drinking. We're humans, so we need to mingle, we need to, to interact, and that's very important. Absolutely. I know you've only been here for a short time. What has been your most impressive moment so far at the Star Summit? Honestly, the, the speaker lineup is quite impressive, yeah? So you, you have Valentin here from um, and, uh, 26, uh, one of the totally outstanding uh, uh, founders. So many great investors and other founders. I was really like, wow, that's a great speaker lineup. So uh, congrats, great done. I would like to finish this interview with five fire questions for you. The idea here is I gave you a selection and you just basically go with your gut feeling what you prefer out of these options that I give you. Are you so you give me several options, I have to pick one. Exactly. Absolutely. You can give a short statement about why you made this choice, okay, but yeah. not longer than one sentence. Okay. So United States, Europe or China? Europe, because that's where my heart is. Cool. Motivation or discipline? Discipline. Why? Discipline is so important. It's a, if you change your habit, uh, you change your life. Work-life balance or 80-hour work week? Oh, 80-hour work week. I totally don't believe in this bullshit like uh, nine to five and we will build a startup and we have to be super relaxed. That's total bullshit. All our outstanding founders, including me at my active times, worked very hard because we loved it. We don't want to go to vacation. And I know there's a different, very different views on it, but this is my view. And if you look at Elon, at Jeff, at Daniel Vigan, at all the outstanding founders, they work hard, they love it, and they should do sports and have healthy, eat healthy stuff, but they should not be three weeks on vacation. That's for me ridiculous. That's what I wanted to hear. Small 10 people teams or large 100 people teams? Oh, it depends on where the, where the company is, but in general, I totally love small teams. Small teams are my favorite. Teams. Cool. And the last one, growth or engagement? <laughs> I'm sorry, but this has to be a combination because you need to see that people engage so that the product works and only then you should invest in growth. 
something I did very wrong at Do the Document app, my last startup. Now it's very successful as ScanBot, but at this time it was a, was a problem. So first engagement, then growth. You described that perfectly in your book with growth, then uh, the engagement, and then last monetization. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for taking the time, Frank. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, we would highly appreciate your rating on Apple Podcasts. In our next episode, we will talk to Kyle Kemper. He's a Canadian entrepreneur and also the president of the Canadian Blockchain Association. He was touring Switzerland for a full week and we talked to him about business opportunities that are powered by the blockchain technology, his view of the crypto valley in Switzerland, and of course also what the Swiss and the Canadian ecosystem in terms of startups can learn from each other. Make sure to tune in to our next bonus episode in August. And until then, I wish you a wonderful day and lots of success.